everyone. I'm Meghna, uh, Meghna Tare from Bits Pilani Pilani campus, Department of Biological Sciences. I, on the behalf of uh, Bits Pilani Library and Biological Sciences and Bits Pilani as an institute, I welcome all of you uh, on this Saturday afternoon uh, to join us for a webinar on publication ethics in scholarly communication. Uh, this uh, webinar has been hosted by uh, Bits Pilani Library in uh, conjunction with uh, Department of Biological Sciences and uh, the uh, company Cabels. Uh, the reason when uh, I essentially like, you know, it's interesting, I should uh, probably let you know how we conceptualize this whole thing. Uh, Sneha had uh, Sneha Road, who is also uh, actually a researcher by heart. <clears throat> and she has a she holds a phd in uh, from pawai uh, she is uh, actually uh, 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 she is a lead journal uh, quality auditor at cabels right now she has been associate editor at elsevier and uh, she had posted on our social media group where a lot of uh, science and technology uh, it's called stem peers group that if you would like to conduct a webinar uh, regarding publication ethics and predatory journals, uh, please do uh, IM me. So essentially, I, I am her and I kept wondering why, uh, like, you know, uh, how to re really, like, you know, pinpoint it to research scholars because we all are right now under a lot of uh, pressure of publishing, the great pressure of publishing right now in academia. Sometimes it leads for research scholars as well as some faculties to uh, not identify the research journals properly. And we end up like you know taking some steps which are not uh, right, and then we keep getting emails right on on almost weekly basis. We get emails that publish with us, publish with 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 us. We have no idea how to identify that journals are predatory. So I'm actually looking forward to this seminar to understand what predatory journals essentially mean for uh, many of us uh, who probably do not even have an idea. And how to uh, how to keep uh, the the integrity of research and publish uh, into like you know how to save ourselves from uh, uh, predatory journals. So uh, I'm very uh, uh, pleased or like it, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Mr. Siman uh, Lenaker. Uh, I'm sorry if I didn't uh, pronounce your name right. It's Simon Lenaker, all right? Uh, he holds a, a master's in philosophy and international business. Uh, currently, he is Director of um, International Marketing and Development at Cabels itself. Uh, he, has, uh, 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 he has been uh, involved into journal acquisitions, uh, open access, and business development. Additionally, he also serve as, serves as tutor for Association of uh, Learned Publishers and uh, uh, society uh, publish, uh, publishers and uh, currently is also a trustee for a uh, committee of uh, publication ethics. Uh, Simon, we really welcome you and we thank you that you could give your Saturday for us uh, to give us this, uh, to, to deliver this lecture and we really look forward to learn a lot. Uh, with that, uh, and uh, before we really uh, invite Simon to start his, uh, like, you know, uh, to start uh, giving us an idea about predatory journal. Uh, may I please introduce uh, uh, Professor Das, who is a prolific researcher and extremely well published. In fact, in our department, and not just our department of biological sciences, uh, uh, he's been there for over two decades. Uh, das, sir, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you're there for two decades. So yeah. if, if we yeah, have I'm any here. problem, I'm if we have any problem related to writing, reading, understanding, administration, he's our to-go person. So uh, because, and then he's an eminent scientist and uh, if I can say eminent musician, eminent artist in general. So uh, please, uh, Dr. Das, uh, we look forward to your inaugural address, uh, Dr. Das. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tari. Thank you so much. I, I will just take a few minutes because I think everybody is waiting eagerly to listen to Dr. Simon. So when Mr. Kunkur first approached me and Dr. Tari also talked about the same, I was wondering why me for a keynote address. Uh, because the reason is, and that's something which we will find out today, I am not even certain of what is the precise definition of predatory journals. 
or if a precise definition exists till date. However, we all know that there are ethics to be followed in scholarly publications. And for the benefit of the research scholars who are, who are on board, I will say one of the basic things in a scientific scholarly publication, especially if you're dealing with experimental data, is to see that someone who reads your paper can faithfully reproduce the experiments and hopefully get somewhere nearby the similar results. So that communication is part of publishing ethics. You should not project your work in such a way that someone else cannot repeat it. That to me is the essence and the difference between a good paper and a social paper. And to me, that remains the hallmark of good ethical standards in scientific publications. Well, I won't take much longer because I think everybody is awaiting to hear the distinguished speaker. And I'll end here by reminding my PhD scholar friends that remember, you may be under pressure today. Some of us have been under pressure for a long, long time, but we have not a given data which is not reproducible and b given data in such a way that the methodology cannot be interpreted so with that i will end my talk thank you so much for inviting me to initiate the proceedings uh, thank you, uh, Das sir and uh, Professor Das. Uh, uh, without further ado, I invite Simon to uh, to give us uh, the lecture on uh, predatory journals and research ethics. Thank you, Simon. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Tarian, and Professor Das. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you. Um, good afternoon in India. Good morning from the UK. Um, I'm just going to put the slides up now. Hopefully you can see the slides. Yeah, um, while Simon projects his slide, may I please request all of you in case you have any questions or any concerns, please feel free to type them into the message boxes. We will take them toward the end uh, one by one. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. So yes, so today I'm going to talk to you about identifying predatory journals. Um, so I'm going to hopefully give you some uh, definition that you can use um, to identify these. But more importantly, I'm going to give you some background into how predatory journals developed and um, the type of um, uh, the type of characteristics and behaviours that they exhibit. I'm going to give you an example of what a predatory journal actually actually looks like, and also the kinds of tricks that they use to um, to 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 entice and to persuade. And people to submit to the journals. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about what we're doing uh, to try and combat the problem in our predatory reports database and also we're going to finish speaking a little bit more broadly about adopting um, an overall publishing strategy both to identify the journals that you shouldn't publish in but also perhaps the journals that you should um, and as Dr Tari said We'll have um, some Q and A afterwards um, if you want to type some questions in the uh, in the message box. So I think you've actually heard my um, introduction. The only thing I would add is that I have published myself. I've published a few articles on things like uh, bibliometrics, so the the study of citation behaviour in journals, and also knowledge in, in transfer, uh, the notion of uh, research impact. So I have gone through the whole process of publishing myself. Um, so I've been on, on both sides of that particular divide. To tell you a little bit about Cabell's, um, so you may not have heard of Cabell's, but it's uh, quite an old company really, it's been around since the late 1970s. It was started by Dr. Dave Cabell, um, who was a management professor in Texas, and he's still the owner and he's still around and, and working with us. Um, primarily, when the the company started, what they did is they created a directory of recommended journals in business and management. So these were the journals that they would recommend that people would uh, publish in. And they would recommend that because they collated various pieces of data that showed that these journals were, were trustworthy. 
And over the years, we've expanded both the, the data that we curate and, and collate for those journals, um, and also we've moved online. In the, so in the early 2000s, we moved online, and now we have the, the database that we now have of these recommended journals is called Journalytics. It's got over 11,000 good quality journals across most disciplines. Um, so across all social sciences and some um, science subjects. In fact, um, early next year, we're hoping to add medical journals um, to our um, index, um, which will add another 5,000 journals. But more recently, we've been looking at um, the, the other side, really. So these are journals that we would not recommend anybody publish in, and those are predatory journals. And we started to um, develop a list about five years ago of predatory journals, and we launched a database in 2017. Um, this database is now called Predatory Reports, and we are nearly up to 14,000 journals listed on there. Um, now, some of you may have heard of something called Beale's List. Um, so uh, Beale's List was started by somebody called Jeffrey Beale. There's a quote there, um, who is really regarded as, um, if you like, the kind of the godfather of predatory journals. He's the person who um, defined uh, that term first. He coined the term predatory journal. He started writing about that in the late 2000s. And he also put together his own list, uh, Beale's list, of predatory journals and predatory publishers. Um, now, this is a complete coincidence, but he actually closed that list in early 2017. Um, and that was just at the same time that we were about to launch our list. And we launched our list in June 2017. Um, we don't actually have any link to Jeffrey Beale. Um, he has advised us in the past when we were starting to look at the Predatory Reports database, but he's now completely moved away from this. And it's worth saying that if you do find Beale's list online, please be aware it hasn't been updated or um, used, um, sorry, updated um, or maintained transparently um, for at least three or four years. Um, there is a bit of a kind of debate, really, about well, how useful it is, because on the one hand, it's a big list of journals and publishers, uh, many of whom are no doubt predatory. But on the other hand, it's a subjective list. And there are various people who have taken it over and have copied and pasted it and updated it and changed it. But none of their procedures are transparent or objective. Um, so it's hard to know where that list um, kind of is now. Um, but nevertheless, he is, is rightly regarded as the person who first highlighted the problem of, of predatory journals. So what is a predatory journal? So it is actually um, very difficult to define. And it, the reason it's difficult is because, well, there's two reasons, really. Firstly, it's a very, there are a very, very wide number of types of predatory journal. So it's very hard to actually have a clear definition that, um, that clearly delineates between a good journal and a predatory journal. But it's also difficult because we're, by necessity, we're dealing with um, what's really criminal activity. Um, so understandably, a lot of the details um, surrounding these journals are often um, opaque. You, we can't see what's actually going on. And therefore, making a, a hard and fast uh, definition is difficult. What we would say really is that a predatory journal is an opportunistic publishing venue that exploits the academic need to publish, but offers little reward for those using their services. And I suppose the two important things there is about the, the opportunistic publishing venues. Okay, so in other words, um, the predatory publishers are trying to take advantage of authors' genuine need to get published. And the second thing there is that they offer little reward for those using their services. Predatory journals do not deliver any type of service that any author would reasonably um, expect to be delivered when they publish in there. And we're going to talk um, a bit later on about a, a big case that happened in the US last year, uh, where one of the big predatory publishers was indeed um, found guilty of not providing the, these services. But generally, what the predatory journals are doing is that they're taking advantage of the, the publish or perish um, scenario, uh, the kind of pressure to publish that Professor Das alluded to in, in, the, in the plenary. Um, everybody who is an academic these days, no matter which country you're in, whether it's India or the UK or anywhere else, is under a, a varying amount of pressure to publish. That kind of you know, comes with the, um, the territory when, you, when you're an academic. And sometimes that pressure is, is very hard to bear. And the temptation is always going to be there 
to try to um, opt for an easy publication um, avenue. And it's undoubtedly true that predatory journals offer a very easy pathway to publish. Because simply put, it's uh, they don't do anything. <laughs> there's no uh, there's no quality barrier. There's no um, other than the payment that you have to make. There's no barrier at all, really, to publishing. Because as we're going to see now, the motivations and methods that predatory publishers use, um, are, they don't make any um, severe requirements of the um, the author. So these kind of motivations and methods, these really will um, back up many of the specific criteria that we use to identify journals to put on our predatory reports database. We've got more than 70 um, individual criteria, but broadly speaking, most of them fall into these five categories. So firstly, you have to put yourself in the position of the predatory publisher to try and understand what they're doing. Their primary goal is to make money. That's their primary motivation. And they do that through what are called APCs or article processing charges. These are the, um, the open access fees that increasingly authors are um, asked to pay to ensure that their article is not just published, but pu published in an open access environment. Um, now, as more and more authors are used to doing this, then the easier it has become for predatory publishers to um, trick authors. Instead of paying a genuine APC that will ensure that their article is peer reviewed and proofed and copy edited and improved, um, they pay an APC and simply they copy and paste the text into a PDF and put it on a website. Sometimes they don't even do that. They just take the money and then disappear. So their primary goal is to make money with the least cost manageable. And often what you'll find is that the APC fees are actually very low. So the average APC of a predatory journal is a lot lower than the average APC of a legitimate journal. So I'll give a very rough and ready example. If you look at the APC of one of the big predator journals, they'll typically be asking for $100 or $200 to submit your article and have it published. If you go to one of the big publishers like, like Wiley or Elsevier, they'll be asking for two to $3,000. Um, and that's kind of a typical difference. Um, now, leaving aside whether that's value for money or not, I'm just kind of showing you what the indicators are and understanding what the primary motivation is for the predatory publishers. They know that they're doing a quick and ready service, so they can afford to charge a lot less um, because they're not really doing anything for that money. Um, the, the major publishers are doing quite a lot of work, um, which is why they, they're charging more money. So secondly, um, they do not care about the quality of the work. So as I said, the they're looking to do the least amount of work possible <laughs> to publish the article. So things like peer review and editing uh, are, are, are simply not happening. Um, and if they do happen, they're not going to be very good. So the, the quality barrier that you would typically expect to try to overcome to ensure that your work is published in a journal it simply isn't there. Um, so that's a really quite a, you know a, a, a big thing to think about when you're going through all of that research and the the pain and the anguish that's caused by pub by doing your research, um, you're not. It's not going to be improved, or it's not going to. Um, the people who are accepting it in a predatory journal don't really care about the quality of the work that you've done. The third thing is about the journals typically will make false claim or promises, and I'm going to show you an example of what a predatory journal looks like and the kind of claims they have later. The typically the most common claim is that that they are a peer-reviewed journal when they're not peer-reviewed, or that they are, for example, that they adopt some of the quality indicators that are out there. And the, probably the biggest indicator is an impact factor. So an impact factor, um, as some, many of you will know, is um, an impact factor is a, a metric that's ascribed to journals who are indexed in the Web of Science database. The Web of Science database is a, a large database of around 13,000 journals that is operated by a company called Clarivate Analytics. Um, the Web of Science um, collates a huge amount of data on these journals, and there's a very, very high barrier of entry to those journals. It's very difficult for publishers to have their journals accepted into that index. Um, 
And when, so, when those journals are accepted, they're given an impact factor based on their citation activity with the other journals in the Web of Science database. So the impact factor is a very, very well known and um, uh, very um, pretty robust uh, metric that's used. And as a result, predatory publishers who want to um, show that their journals are quality, but without having any of the actual quality behind them, will therefore make false claims and promises and say that their journals either have an impact factor or that they have a type of impact factor. And it's worth stating here categorically that there is only one impact factor. The impact factor is actually a, a trademark of um, Clarivate Analytics. So it's actually illegal for anybody to um, say that their journal's got an impact factor if it doesn't. But often, predatory publishers will then say that they've got something called an SG impact factor or a Google impact factor or some other type of impact factor. There is very simply only one impact factor. So if you see a journal says that it has an impact factor, you can check. So there's a website called the Master Journal List. So if you just Google Master Journal List and Clarivate or Web of Science, that will point you to the master journal list. And the master journal list is the list of all journals that have an impact factor. And all the journals are listed there with a previous impact factor. So it's not the current impact factor, it's the impact factor that's a year old. Um, you, you can get the up-to-date data, but you have to subscribe to um, Web of Science in order to see that. So you can easily check by going to master journal list if a claim is false or not. Um, and this is gonna be a theme um, of my talk today is that at face value, there are lots of things that are being said and being claimed, but you have to go behind that and you have to use your research skills to try and find out the truth of the matter. Now, another thing to realize is that the um, predatory publishers are basically, not only are they unethical, but they're often linked to criminal gangs. So they are not just involved in predatory journals, but they're often involved in much more serious crimes, or um, when I say serious crimes, you know, crimes, you know, involving um, drugs or arms or, or things like that. It's quite a, a, a murky uh, world. So you're not dealing with people who are just kind of entrepreneurial. You're often dealing with people who are criminal. And, um, and that's not really something that you would want to do in terms of um, your, um, the kind of venue that you choose for, to publish your research in. And finally, they, follow, they fail to follow accepted standards. So they don't deliver on any of the services that they, uh, they say they do. So for example, they'll often say that their website is viewed by millions of people, and it's simply false. It's not viewed by millions of people. Um, it's actually viewed by very few people. And as we're gonna see shortly, there's a reason why not many people will actually, um, even if you do publish your article in these art journals, not many people will, will find it. So, just looking specifically at the um, problem of predatory publishing with, with India, um, unfortunately there's two um, quite um, damaging statistics really when it comes to India and predatory publishing. Firstly, um, there's published research that shows that the country that is most likely to have um, academics publishing in predatory journals is India. You can see from the pie chart there, which is from an article published by Bjork and Shen in 2015, which is one of the kind of seminal um, articles about predatory publishing. Um, they looked at who was publishing in these journals, and they found that over 27% of the authors um, in their study were uh, from based in India, which is the highest uh, percentage from, from a specific country. As you can see, there are, you know, it's not just um, focused on India, there's plenty of people from North America who are doing it and from Europe and Africa and, and elsewhere. So it's a global problem. But the problem in India is compounded by the fact that we know from compiling the predatory reports database that most journals um, that are, are most predatory journals are based in India. And partly, partly this is because um, a few of the very biggest predatory journal publishers are based in India. In fact, and there's a company called Omics International, which we're going to talk about shortly, um, which is probably the biggest by number of journals. Um, and despite the fact it doesn't claim um, that it claims it's based in, in America, it's not. It's, it's owned by, um, it's based in India, um, owned by an Indian person. And um, it has more than 700 journals on our predatory 
a reports database, so 5% of all the journals that we have. So there's a, a significant number of these journals are also based in India. So, um, and this is why you've seen the, the, for example, with the UGC care list and the activities by the UGC, India very much recognised that it's a particular problem and the, the government and UGC are, are obviously very active in trying to do something about it. Um, another kind of thing about, um, there's lots of kind of, of hearsay and rumour about who publishes in these journals. Um, we've done some research that shows that, for example, it's not just um, low-level universities that have a problem where they've had their faculty members publishing in journals. So, for example, we've looked across um, a number of NITs, and just in the last two years, we found more than 20 articles have been published by authors based at NITs. We've also looked at um, um, Bits Pilani, and we found that actually um, over um, the last kind of decade or so, then there's been around 25 uh, publications from authors who've identified themselves as, as a Bits Pilani authors um, across the different campuses. So um, that's not to highlight there's a problem specifically with Bits Palani. We could probably look at pretty much any university in India um, and we would find this information. And in fact, we've got um, some ongoing research that's been led by my colleague Snea, who is looking at the kind of widespread issues of, of publications by um, authors across um, different u universities across India. Um, so it's, it's a really, really big problem in India, and that's why I'm really happy to, to be able to talk to you about it today. Now, um, sometimes we get some pushback about predatory publishing, and people will say, well, what's the harm? Uh, what, is there really any, um, is there any danger that comes out of um, an author publishing their article in a predatory journal? Well, we would say, yes, there is, and specifically we would say that there are three dangers to authors if they publish in a predatory journal. So firstly, the danger number one is that they'll, the work may be subject to subpar peer review, if, it's, if there's any peer review at all. Now I think it was a really important point made by um, Professor Das at the start there about thinking as an author that you're, you must ensure that your article and your research is reproducible or repeatable. And that's, that's an incredibly important point because you have a responsibility when you publish an article and publish your research that whoever reads that has to trust that what your, uh, what your findings um, are in the article are true. And one of the ways that you do that is to submit it to the peer review process. But when you submit to a predatory journal, often, more often than not, there's no peer review. Uh, sometimes there is a peer review, but it's a subpar peer review. It's not a good peer review. It's often a very quick peer review. Um, when you submit to a legitimate journal, then you know that um, the peer review that you're going to be given is going to be rigorous. It may take a long time and it may be frustrating, but it is going to be a rigorous peer review. And one of the reasons that it is so rigorous is that it's designed to ensure that the research that you're publishing is repeatable. And if it's not, then you're not going to pass peer review. So the whole benefit of the peer review process is then missed out in predatory publishing. Second danger is that your work could actually disappear. Uh, we've got numerous journals on our database where there's no content. And that's because the predatory journals have either set the journal up and never published anything, that's not to say they've never received anything, but they haven't actually published anything. Or that they have published things and then suddenly they've just one day wiped it clean and, and taken their, the, the, um, their articles off. So one of our criteria is that we have to see evidence that a, um, a publisher will, has promised um, to ensure that the articles published in the journal will always be accessible. And usually that means that the publisher will pay um, what's what called an archiving service. So they'll pay a, an archiving service who will essentially, for a fee, ensure that they store articles um, in a digital library and that they, even if there's like a the server breaks down or there's a fire or whatever happens, that they, they've copied the content and will make it available to anybody who's got access um, into, in, into the future. Um, predatory publishers don't do that. They may say they do it, but actually uh, they don't do it. 
So there's no guarantee that all of that work and all of that effort you put into your research to publish the article, it may not be there tomorrow. And finally, the third danger is that your work will be hard to find. So one of the things that publishers do that perhaps people don't realize is that they make huge investments into what's called search engine optimization or SEO. So SEO involves getting the, so you get the, the Word document and then you ascribe metadata. So all of the typical words that define that document, however many, uh, you know, these are hundreds and thousands of words that define that document. And those words will sit behind the document and those are the words that will are used by the Google algorithm and search engine algorithms to actually find that information, assess how relevant the information is to the search request. And then when that, that search request is presented, the most relevant research will be found at the top. Now, um, legitimate publishers spend a huge amount of money and investing in things like SEO because it's in their interest to. The more you invest in SEO, the better the metadata that you ascribe to an article, the better will be the search results, the higher up the Google algorithm will, it will appear, and therefore the more likely the citations and the usage will, will accrue from that. So the better the CEO, sorry, the better the SEO, the better the usage and the better the citations. And essentially, usage and citations are how subscription publishers and open access publishers basically make money. The better the citations, that means the higher quality the journal's reputation will be. The higher the usage, that means the better uh, return on investment people who are subscribing or people who are paying to publish will get from their money because they'll be, um, the, they'll be able to look at the usage statistics and therefore the most used articles will be the most valuable. So there's a real incentive in place for legitimate publishers to have the to have optimal SEO, and therefore that will help them build the brand of their journals. Predatory publishers don't do that. They don't do any SEO because it costs money, and they don't care that your article will never be found and never be cited because they're not playing by those rules. They simply want the money up front from the APC, and then they'll stick it online, and they don't care if it never gets read and never gets cited. So by going through, again, all of that pain and anguish of publishing your article and doing your research, and then you're effectively burying it uh, where nobody's going to find it. Because as, as you all know, as researchers, when you do a search, you look at the first and second and third page of Google, and we know that around two thirds of research is discovered via Google. So we, the Google is really important. But when, by the time you get to page four or page five, you've probably got enough relevant research to look at. Not you're going to, um, unless you're looking for something very, very specific, you're not going to go through pages and pages. So this is the third danger for predatory publishers is that you go through all that problem, all that pain, and actually your research will never be found. And if your research is really important, uh, then it's kind of a wasted effort. Now I mentioned about um, the, what's probably the biggest open access pub um, predatory publisher out there, Omics International. And so this was a, um, there's something in America called the Federal Trade Commission, which seeks to ensure fair trade. And they started an investigation into Omics International after complaints that people who were publishing in their journals were not being delivered the service that they thought they were going to get. So they did a big investigation and they ultimately found that um, essentially Omics International through its journals were defrauding authors um, out of millions of dollars because um, in return for the APC that they were paying to publish in its journals, they were not receiving the um, services that they would expect. They would expect peer review, copy editing, proofreading, SEO, etc., etc. and none of that was happening. So they found um, in favor of authors and they fined um, Omics International just over $50 million. And that, they came to that figure because they looked over a six year period um, through all these hundreds of journals and the thousands of articles that were published. And that was the total amount of APCs that authors paid to Omics International over the, that period. So it's not um, a kind of small problem, it's actually quite a big problem. We've done some calculations and if you took 
the amount paid over that six year period and you extrapolate that to all the journals we got in predatory um, database, the predatory reports database, we estimate that between 100 and 150 million dollars is spent every year by authors um, in publishing their articles in predatory journals. And as we've seen, that's 150 million dollars that gives you articles that won't be found and won't be cited or very will very rarely be cited um, and have not had peer review, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is really a huge waste of money. And just remember where this money comes from. Typically, these um, author, uh, these article processing charges, APCs, they'll be paid for by the authors themselves, or the authors' universities, or the authors' funding agencies who've supported their research. Um, now, none of those three uh, agencies can really afford to spend $150 million a year on, on wasted effort. So it really is a, a big problem globally. But that's not the only um, kind of story that's been in the news about predatory journals. In Germany, there was a, a, an investigation that Cavell's helped with a couple of years ago that found that more than 5,000 German um, authors had published in um, predatory journals. And perhaps more sinister, they found that a number of articles had been published by employees of um, big um, corporations based in Germany, specifically um, some pharmaceutical companies and some um, automobile manufacturing companies. And what seems to have been happening is that employees would publish the research that had been done in the pharmaceutical and automobile companies. Um, and basically, it was kind of a way of content marketing. They would publish the research that had been done. Obviously, that hadn't passed peer review or anything or like that. But for the relatively low price uh, of an APC, they were able to say that their published research showed that their pharmaceutical products or their automobile products were performing well. Um, and obviously, it's <laughs> when you know that that hasn't gone through peer review, um, then there's no real check as to the, the truth of those claims. So it's not just about um, defrauding authors out of the money. There's also a, a kind of another problem which is authors who are essentially taking advantage of the predatory research, uh, sorry, of the predatory journals and the, the model that's used. And really, there's been some research pu published recently that shows that those are the two major motivations of authors. Not really motivations, I guess that's the two behavioral characteristics of authors who publish in these journals. It's difficult to find this information because obviously people who have published in these journals don't want to admit it. But when you do talk to them, it seems that primarily they were simply unaware that the journal they were publishing in was a predatory journal. And secondly, if they were aware, then they were being quite cynical and they were um, they were taking advantage of the easy to publish and quick to publish model to essentially tick a box. Because of the publish or perish scenario or whatever, there were incentives in place that meant that publishing quickly in a, a journal that had a very little or no reputation was advantageous for them. And so that's something that they um, they followed through. So it's a big global problem. So what is um, Cabell's doing about it? So what Cabell's is doing is that, as I said, we've created a predatory reports database and we've listed um, and we continue to review this uh, around 70, just over 70 behavioral indicators that flag potentially uh, predatory behavior. So as an example here of a journal, which is actually an omics international journal. And this is the kind of information that we collate. We look at where it says it's based um, and we kind of um, record when we've actually reviewed it and we list the violations that we have. So for example, in this journal, the publisher hides obscures relationships with for-profit partner companies. So there's a suspicion here that maybe this journal is being used by other companies um, to publish research, um, but you know, not going through peer review, et cetera. Or that there are problems with the website. Um, so it does not identify a physical address for the publisher or give us a fake address, that kind of thing. That's another common thing that we that we see. So um, I'm just going to share you with you a, um, this is what a predatory journal looks like. So I'm going to take you through some of the characteristics of this um, journal and hopefully you'll see some, you'll be able to use this 
um, in your own research uh, when you're trying to decide whether a journal is trustworthy or not. So this is a journal that is published by Long Dom. Um, you won't know this, but Long Dom is a, an imprint of Omics International. So um, I think it's fairly safe to say if you see uh, anything to do with Omics International relating to a journal, then I would start to um, be so very suspicious. Like I mentioned before in the banner ad there at the top, it says that there are 25 plus million website visitors. Um, even like big journals like The Lancet will struggle to get 25 million website visitors, let alone an obscure journal in automobile engineering. So this is an example of when you're presented with information, being critical about it and, and having a kind of critical mindset really is important because you can't believe everything you see, especially when you're presented with the editor. So the editor there is Margaret Stack and it lists her as editor-in-chief and professor of University of Strathclyde in the UK. So if you Google Margaret Stack, you will indeed find that she's professor of automobile engineering at the University of Strathclyde in the UK. So that stacks up, yeah? Not true. If you actually look at her um, profile, the University of Strathclyde says that she is an editor-in-chief of a very reputable journal, but it's not this journal. It's a completely different journal. Margaret Stack is not editor-in-chief of Advances in Automobile Engineering. So she, this journal has essentially stolen her identity and they've taken somebody who is well known in automobile engineering and they've put her there as editor. So anybody who looks at this, who knows the kind of um, prominent authors and prominent um, academics in automobile engineering, may think, oh, Margaret Stack, yeah, she's at Strathclyde. She's the editor of the journal. Well, we trust her, we know her, we've seen her present at a conference. So the journal must be legitimate, but it isn't. A second thing to look at is the, the gentleman to on her left, which is Dr. Mohamed Kachau, who's listed as Associate Professor in Tunisia. And indeed, he is an Associate Professor in Tunisia. The problem with him is the way that his affiliation is listed. So firstly, it's listed as Dr. Mohamed Kachau. So Margaret Stark and Etim Ubong, presumably they're doctors as well, why aren't they listed as doctors? His surname is all in capitals, but Stack and Ubong are not in capitals. And he's associate professor with a lowercase p, but Stack and Ubong are professors with an uppercase p. Now, for a, a good journal to make one of those inconsistent errors would be unusual. For it to make three is is actually pretty damning. You simply would not see that made, that all three errors in one person's um, affiliation made by a journal. And so therefore, this doesn't mean, oh, it's a predatory journal, it's evil. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that these are indicators. And after having reviewed thousands and thousands of predatory journals, you see the same kinds of indicators crop up time and time again. So mistakes in English on websites are an indicator. It doesn't prove it, but it is an indicator. And you start to build a picture. So already you've got a false claim about the number of, or a highly suspicious claim about the number of website visitors. You've got a stolen identity of the editor. You've got instant inconsistencies in one of the editorial board members. But that's not all. If you look at the left there, it says share this page, and you see this time and time again on website pages. You can they'll have a Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, etc. links. And that looks legitimate. However, if you actually try to click on those, they don't work. And again, why would you have why would you go to the trouble of including social media links if you're not able to actually engage with social media? The final thing I want to show there is at the top right. Um, and there's an ISSN code and a mobile phone number. So often people think, oh, it's got an ISSN. That means it's a real journal. Unfortunately, that's not the case. 40% of the journals that we um, list on, on Predigy Reports have got an ISSN. Most of them are genuine ISSNs. Some of them completely made up. 
Now you can check if the ISSN is genuine or not, and you can go to something called the ISSN portal and to, to check if that is, is valid or not. However, ISSN do not check if a journal is predatory or not. They simply check if a journal is active. So a journal can be actively predatory and it can get an ISSN quite straightforwardly. So just because an ISSN is there, it doesn't mean it's a legitimate journal. The second thing is, again, you have to be critical. Why would a journal have a, an, a UK mobile phone number listed there? Now, the honest answer is that we don't know really either why, but when you look at journals, uh, legitimate journals, they do not have mobile phone numbers or any other phone number for that matter on their website. And the only thing that we can think about is that these journals, um, they want to make the, uh, the purchase decision as quick as possible. So they want to offer an avenue so somebody can actually phone up and effectively submit their journal over the phone and pay over the phone by, by phoning a number. And obviously, they're not going to have an official number. It's much easier for them to have, whether it's a burner phone or something like that, I don't know but they've got a mobile phone number that's probably not easily traceable. So that's why they've got a mobile phone number. Again, it, isn't, it doesn't prove that it's a predatory journal, but often when you go to predatory journal websites, you get pop-ups with mobile phone numbers, or even you get chat boxes like you do for other, if you were to go to with other um, websites. And so the predatory publishers are using modern technology to access your money as quickly and as easily as possible. They're not doing it as some sort of customer service. So there's lots here to identify that this is a predatory journal, but you do have to be critical in your thinking. You have to basically not trust what you see and try to do some research behind it and to identify what the truth actually is. So what I'm gonna just finish with now is kind of um, the flip side of all of this. So we've been talking about um, the good journals, uh, sorry, the bad journals, predatory journals, journals that you should not publish in. But in order to have a coherent publishing strategy, and we would definitely advise that you do have a publishing strategy, in other words, you've got goals in place into the future as to what you want to achieve with your publications, then number one, avoid predatory journals and do everything you can and do all the research that you can to avoid them. That's good. But number two is to actually um, look at the journals that you should publish in. So we also have our journalistics database, um, but there are other databases out there that you may have access to or that you can um, look up. So we've already talked about Web of Science. There's another journal web database called Scopus, which is a really big database. Um, and there may well be uh, there's recommendations from your peers that you could use. There's various ways of, of accessing information about the kinds of journals that you should be publishing in. So just as an example, in the journalistics database that we have, then we list things like um, what the acceptance rate is of the journal, what type of peer review, because our that's one of the major um, characteristics of the journals in journalistics is that they have a robust peer review in place, and that's something that we, have, we check and we do an audit of. What their time to review and time to publication is, who the editor is, what their kind of citation activity is, what um, what their alt metrics look like. In other words, to what extent are they popular with social media? So there's a whole range of information. And what we would always recommend is that you take a kind of what's called a basket of metrics. So a whole range of metrics that are important to you, whether that's the list, the type of journal that you should publish in according to your um, to Bits Palani, if they offer any uh, guidance of the type of journal you should publish in whether you as an Indian uh, or a, a scholar based in India, what type of journal you should publish in. Maybe you've got um, ambitions to move abroad and you want to go to Australia, in which case there's a journal here that's based in Australia. And it may be good if your future is identified as being in Australia, then to publish in an Australian journal would be advantageous. So there's a whole range of information that's available out there that you can use to optimize your publishing strategy. Avoid the predatory journals, identify what good journals look like, build a short list of the kind of journals to, to publish in, and that's how you can uh, move forward with your publishing career. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you very much for your time uh, this afternoon, and I'll stop sharing.
and we can go to some uh, questions. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Simon. And uh, before, uh, like, uh, uh, I would just uh, quickly introduce uh, Dr. Priya Sande. Uh, Priya is uh, a faculty in Department of Chemical Engineering. She holds a PhD from the Bitspilani itself. And she works on computational fluid dynamics here. And today, uh, she's going to talk about uh, a research paper. Uh, Priya, you can probably start the uh, your presentation as well. Uh, today she is going to talk about research, uh, sorry, ethics and critical thinking. And uh, meanwhile, I'll uh, uh, I'll uh, uh, I'll probably ask few questions. Those have been there into the uh, chat box. So uh, essentially, uh, Navya has asked if we can take it uh, as a rule of thumb if a journal is not listed on Scopus uh, or. Uh, Clavier at, uh, at uh, then it is probably a uh, predatory or avoidable at any rate. So does uh, essentially the question uh, means probably uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Navya, uh, that if it is Scopus index, then it is good, and if it is not, then probably it is a predatory journal. Simon. Oh yeah, okay. Um, so I I wouldn't be as um, as kind of black and white about that. Um, so, so firstly, there have been um, cases where um, journals have been accepted um, and indexed by Scopus, but then they've been removed by Scopus. And you can actually see the journals that Scopus have removed if you go to their website. They've been removed by Scopus um, for suspected play, um, predatory activity. <laughs> but I have to say, to be fair to Scopus, they've got more than 30,000 journals indexed and there's a very few, like a handful of journals that's happened to. So it's 99.9% um, it's .9 certain that if a journal has been indexed by Scopus, then it's probably not predatory. But there have been predatory journals indexed by Scopus, okay? Okay. okay. On the other side, then I, I couldn't say that if a journal has not been on Scopus, then it is predatory. Then that, that's that's not true. So if you think about um, there's a a a, um, um, a resource that librarians will be familiar with called Ulrix. So mm -hmm. Ulrix is a database of all journals. Or it tries to be a database of all journals. It's very hard to actually list all journals that are out there. And the last figure I saw is that they had 117,000 journals on their list. I see. So. Even with Scopus, uh, they've got over 30,000 journals. Let's assume that all those journals are good. You've still got around 80,000 journals out there. Um, and um, so none of the Scopus journals, as far as I'm aware, are on, on the Predator Reports database at the moment. And we've mm -hmm. got 14,000. So if you subtract that, you've still got 65,000 or so journals out there that are not on Scopus and not on the Predator Reports database. Now. That you would kind of slightly tongue in cheek. We we often call these journals the kind of grey list, yeah, mm -hmm. because they are not. Um, we wouldn't recommend that people publish in them, but nor would we say that they're predatory. They're kind of in between. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them will be predatory. Some of them will be incredibly niche. Some of them will be um, they've stopped working. Um, some of them only work sometimes. Um, some of them have only just been set up and haven't you know developed a. Um, um, uh, like a reputation yet. There's a whole range of different journals in that kind of grey area. Nice. So, um, so what I would say in terms of a kind of strategy, then if you remove all of the the journals that are definitely predatory, for example, they're on the predatory reports database, and you accept that you you trust um, either Scopus or Cabell's Journalytics or Web of Science then you're kind of removing that problem, okay? So it's not that the journals that are not listed on Scopus are predatory, but it's difficult to identify what type of journal they are if they're not listed on one of the major databases. Mm -hmm. So therefore that shows the value of those databases because they've kind of done that work for you. They've sifted through all of those gray journals and they're only listing the journals that they would recommend people publish in. But it's not quite as black and white as saying scope is as 100% good and everything else is bad. It's not, it's, it's not quite like that. 
Okay, thank you so much, Simon. We'll take another question after Priya uh, gets done uh, with the talking. Uh, Priya, over to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Meghna Tare. And uh, I'm going to talk about the research paper, Ethical and Critical Thinking Aspects, which is quite a challenge to talk about uh, such deep aspects. So you know what they say, if you ask uh, a person in general a question, they'll give you a yes and no. But if you ask a um, scientist or an engineer, you'll get an analysis. So what I'm uh, going to give you is an analysis and uh, with the uh, opinions as somebody inside, not as a decision maker, but as someone just trying to publish the pa their papers. And uh, I would just uh, promise that it will be short because I have just 10 slides here. And uh, to make it a little different, I'm going to start off with a small story. And I'd like you to come along with me uh, through that story because I would be able to make a few quick points uh, through the story. So you can all see this picture here, uh, which seems to be uh, two women with the baby in a basket uh, standing before um, uh, somebody who seems to be uh, standing in the place of a judge. And uh, these two women actually had come to this judge uh, because they said that there was a live baby and a dead baby. And both of the women claimed that in the middle of the night, the baby was swapped. And in fact, the live baby belonged to uh, them. So both of them claimed that. And uh, so the king uh, looked at this, um, the king judge in those days were the same, looked at this case and immediately uh, paused for some time. And then uh, he said, I order that we slice this baby in two and uh, give half to one woman and half to the other. So uh, as soon as he said, gave this order, uh, of course, the real mother who was uh, having that uh, emotional attachment with the baby was able to uh, reveal herself and she immediately shouted out and said, please don't do that and uh, rather give the other woman the baby. I lay no claim to the baby. So uh, uh, what I want to tell you is I think that the ethical outcome, we have no question about that, that uh, whether the baby went to the right mother, I don't think there's any dispute that any of us think that the baby should have gone to the mother who did not cry out to save the baby. We are almost sure about that. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the ethical behavior of the king. Uh, was his ruse that he played, was that in fact ethical? So uh, let's, let's go into the weeds a bit here. So uh, what uh, the people, as soon as he gave the order that the baby should be cut in two, uh, many people were affected with that order. So uh, for example, the people, the baby, we have to consider all these options as well as the two women. Now looking at the baby, uh, since it was a baby, I didn't understand anything. Uh, but if you think about if it were a young child or even a teenager, then this would have had a huge impact on the teenager, the roots that the king played. And uh, thinking about the uh, people, they would have been a bit horrified. And even the woman who was not the mother would not have, of course, mattered much. But it was the woman who was the real mother who possibly felt the most amount of anguish and sheer terror in that five minutes before uh, she thought that the baby would be sliced into two. Uh, so uh, as far as the baby is concerned, the king seems to have passed the test. But what about the, the terror that she felt in that five minutes? Uh, well, immediately we think about what, uh, what our current practices are and we do see that there is compensation which employers pay their employees and uh, it looks like even though the king gave uh, such a ruse, she was uh, aptly reward rewarded uh, because uh, she got her baby back and in fact it was the quickest way to get her baby back possibly rather than going through a very uh, you know, um, scrutiny of their personal lives. So if you look at it overall, uh, this was a very sticky ethical situation. So what the points I want to make is possibly we are going to face uh, the, this particular one, uh, this kind of uh, what I'm going to call the sticky details kind of ethical decision making when we are writing a paper or when we have to give up our data rather than, you know, the very black and white uh, ones. And just now uh, the journey that I've taken you on, I think we've just done a lot of critical thinking in just this couple of minutes. And critical thinking is defined as being able to think about something with our, in an objective way and without blocks for the purpose of um, coming at some kind of a judgment. 
So uh, what I've just demonstrated is that uh, critical thinking would obviously go hand in hand with ethical behavior or any kind of ethical considerations. And what I want to say is that it seems like critical thinking is just thinking without roadblocks. So this was, of course, the historic uh, uh, King Suleiman or Solomon in English. And this is that uh, story from that historical uh, record there. And I did not tell you that because uh, we, would, we would have been actually biased that he would have made a right decision. But through our analysis, we were able to think through it. And we could actually uh, come to the conclusion, yeah, that he ticked all the boxes. And he did, even though he uh, did make a ruse, he did not violate anything. So uh, what are the elements of a just? system. Uh, I'm not talking about a justice system, but any kind of system in general. Uh, I think following our three branches of government, we have, of course, the law and the legislature, the accountability in the courts. And uh, we have the executive body, which I believe gives not just uh, the maintains the state of our country, but actually gives that very much needed objectivity uh, through that process. So when I talk about how important objectivity is, it's like the peer review that happens when we write our paper, because we are not in a position to really review that. And another example would be when we have examinations, we never allow students to correct their own examination papers, no matter how uh, good the students might be. It's not a matter of how good their ethics are, but it's a matter of uh, do we are having objectivity in that particular uh, system. So I'm going to talk about law, which is what we would always be thinking about whenever we make ethical decisions. And by law, I mean guidelines or I mean uh, ethical behavior, ethical practices. Uh, so uh, what are the, actually the types of laws? So one would be a moral law. Let's think about that. And one is possibly what I'm calling a cons consent law. Uh, I'm trying to distinguish these two, though they may actually be together sometimes. A consent law is something that possibly we all are going to just uh, decide on doing, right? For example, the percentage of our tax that we pay, those kind of things are, uh, could fall under consent law. So we actually know the source of the consent law, uh, which is a groups of people. Uh, now, what about the source of this moral law? And um, at this point, I would like to demonstrate something if we have a bit of time. And uh, I would like to just have a bit of back and forth with Dr. Meghna Tare here. Uh, Meghna? Can you just uh, answer a few questions? Because I want to demonstrate something. And I have not uh, rehearsed this with Meghna, so she doesn't know anything about it. Sorry, what did you say? Uh, what do you, you want to do both? Uh, no, I just want to do a back and forth with you. I want to ask you a few questions, and I want you to just respond. <laughs> OK, yeah, yeah. I want to demonstrate something over here. Uh, so uh, Meghna, I think you uh, possibly would be giving uh, some amount uh, to some kind of a charitable cause. Am I right? Maybe in some yeah. particular yeah. way. OK, so why do you do that, Meghna? Why do I do that? Yeah, yeah. There's no um, right answer. I'm just. Yeah, there is no right answer, right? Yeah. Ah, for the peace of mind. For peace of mind, uh, why do you get peace of mind, Meghna, when you do that? Uh, that's a tricky question. I don't know. I never thought about okay, it. Okay, thank you. You answered my question, Meghna. That's exactly what I wanted to show. I mean, uh, we cannot rationalize it totally, and I would actually be going into metaphysics if I had to explain that. So I'm just trying to say that uh, we think that we are completely rational beings, but some amount of that, as we just now demonstrated, is coming from moral, uh, just moral considerations, not just that we have consented to do that. Uh, so let, now let's look at this uh, research paper system. Uh, and uh, uh, I've just tried to make it a bit colorful here. So there's lots going on. And I think all of us are in the system. So it's this big, crazy machine in the middle over here, which you can see this picture. And uh, this consists of all the editors, the right, uh, all of us writers, and that entire process that's going on until uh, with all the input of papers, and you have some papers getting rejected, and then you have only a few papers going through this crazy big machine, right? So I think this is a place uh, very uh, where a lot of ethical decisions, a uh, number of ethical decisions are being taken every day. So it's a high density ethical decision flow sheet. Uh, and I just wanted to show an interesting point that even though there's no feedback loop as such in, uh, in this, obviously papers don't get recycled, but the papers which do get accepted, uh, they are going to influence the papers which are going to come in again in the sense that uh, published research uh, would be easier to follow up. 
rather than unpublished ones. So that sprouts many more research works. So when we're talking about this machine, can we put some kind of an ethical framework onto it? And for that, I have gone to Kantian ethics. And of course, there are many ethical frameworks, like the Gandhian ethics of trusteeship and the egalitarian framework of ethics. And I've just, I have chosen uh, the Kantian ethics and I've uh, re referred to this book of ethics, which is Boatwright and Patra, which is the standard book for ethics, uh, which is even taught in Bitspilani. And the reason why it looks like it seems to match our situation. So what uh, Kant said was that moral obligations have nothing to do with consequences, but they arise solely from a moral law that is binding on all rational beings. So what he's actually saying is we don't do what we do just because we are only afraid of consequences. But um, uh, it seems to be that he's saying that because we are rational beings, we also come packaged with this other ability. So that's what I'm interpreting from the statement, uh, which seems to be that ethical ability, uh, which we just now saw was that moral thing, which we are not able to give the answer for. Uh, but that doesn't, of course, help us to uh, you know, distinguish which laws or which things, maxims, are um, moral or not, So if, even if you want to follow them. So Kant gave this statement, and he said that act only according to that maxim, which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. So what he's actually saying is you need to act in a way that uh, you would wish any, everyone else to act with. So uh, it seems to be when he says a universal law, it's bringing out a sort of consistency, uh, which we would all be happy with because it's, if, one, if it's true for one person, it's true for the other. But more than that, people have uh, said that isn't this a sort of uh, appeal to consequences? because ultimately you would like everyone to act in that way. But Kant said mainly that it's not that you would um, act wrongly because of a consequence, but you would actually be putting uh, you know, dry wood on the funeral pyre of that particular system, which would go up in flames down the line. So that's exactly what he's saying, that if you do not act in that way, which you would wish uh, everyone else to act in, then uh, this, uh, this uh, system going up in flames much down the line is at stake, not just something happening to you in the short run. So we'll look, think of the triangle and uh, the, the main apex of one of the uh, parts of the triangle, corners of the triangle was the law. And uh, I don't think I need to tell you all the laws we do have, know about what we ought to be doing and not doing. Uh, but I just want to give you this play, playground an analogy. Uh, which is like when there are children you know, playing in the playground, uh, if they do not know where the boundary is and the boundary line or the fence is like the moral law that we're talking about or even the law in general, uh, then they would actually be uh, scared. They might clump into the center of the place or, you know, some of them who are really naughty might actually just run off into the woods and they might not, uh, you know, be playing at all. Uh, but if you have that uh, fence or boundary and everyone knows and it's visible, even if the kids have a rough idea, but if you actually uh, make it very more black and white, then you have the possibility that all the kids would actually play together. Uh, and they would use the entire space. And in fact, that gives you more, uh, gives the children more freedom. So what I'm trying to say is not so much that uh, we don't know the laws, but if we are a little uh, not so clear about them, our freedom is actually uh, less. And I'll just talk about this uh, interesting aspect uh, a little bit soon. And I'm glad to say that I think I'm, this is definitely not an exhaustive list, but from what I found and thought about and just noted down, by the way, you don't find this written anywhere on any website, you know, all the laws that uh, researchers have to follow, though you have COPE giving us guidelines and uh, helpful guidelines. Uh, it seems that all of these uh, follow our national law, which is uh, do not provide a false testimony and don't steal. So I, I think I'm not mistaken, and I'm happy to be uh, corrected, that all of these actually fall into some form of uh, not pr giving a false testimony and not stealing. Right. So even if you talk about something like I just talk about the ones which are bolded, uh, do not claim more than the data justifies. So in that case, you are providing a sort of false kind of testimony. 
Uh, do not be willfully negligent. That's a tough one. So you may say, what's that got to do with false testimony or some kind of lying? But it's some kind of self-lying because you already know that what the standards are supposed to be. And if you are negligent willfully, then it's sort of a lying over there at that uh, at that place of uh, self-lying. So um, uh, do not recycle claims is, of course, being um, not plagiarizing and um, not stealing. And you might come into a funny situation if you uh, plagiarize something uh, and uh, that something is wrong, then you might actually be giving false testimony and stealing at the same time. So I think we know these laws and I want to talk about the objectivity by which we are maintaining science. That's the other corner of the triangle. And I'm just telling you what uh, science seems to be, what exactly we are maintaining, because as uh, all of us have our own personal goals and we would like to publish as many papers as we want to as per our goals. But we do have to think about what exactly we are maintaining here. We are maintaining uh, this uh, burden of science. And I think what science, uh, how that mechanism, we are part of the mechanism of science and how science moves forward is basically what we are trying to uh, take care of. So science moves forward in small increments and uh, there uh, when you when I think when it goes through that entire system the better paper is the paper which has a higher predictive power or a higher applicability. It's not just about the fitting of the data but it is about can uh, I think I, I can say it in a way that how general is the paper how much can it predict beyond the conditions that uh, under which the paper was made and so those are uh, the kind of evaluations that we as the authors cannot do which of course the editors and peer reviewers are doing it's not just about fitting the data verification by data reproduction as already mentioned is a self-correcting factor and very important so this leads to an interesting thought that it's good to have a lot of overlapping works because that actually is uh, helpful in the self-correction and this is not the same as re-reporting so what i'm trying to say is it's not every referencing that we do re-reporting as in referencing does not strengthen that original paper but actually if you are writing those particular references in your results and discussion section those references you are actually strengthening them because you yourself are saying that these were in line with my data. So uh, we have to be careful about re-reporting is not always uh, reproduction. And uh, conclusions open to evolution, which we already know, but of course not data, we haven't seen data always evolving. And the last point is opposing theories narrow over time. And what I mean by this is that the theories seem to uh, gain evidence or seem to uh, not gain evidence. And therefore, that's how the theories get narrowed down, not with any human kind of artificial intervention, but in the process itself. And it's not so much as like running a race where some theories are winning, but it's a little more like death and resurrection, where some theories may actually get resurrected uh, suddenly because of a context. So I think this is what we are trying to maintain. This is science. And I have a blank slide here, <laughs> mainly to tell us the accountability. And I'm going to come back to this uh, very soon before I wind up uh, the talk. The last point of that um, triangle, which is accountability. And I just want to tell the possible implications of how, if science works well, what's going to happen. I think these are the implications. There's going to be a moderate number of papers processed, not going to be an overload, because, of course, that is a flow sheet. And you can't have so many papers going in such that peer reviewers cannot see uh, what is actually, you know, they cannot distinguish. Uh, I think that we are at a point when there's a very e exponential explosion of papers getting into the, the system, and I would just like to sound off on this. Uh, reviewers focusing on claims and not agreement. So uh, if you are having, uh, if the law is clear to everyone, then reviewers can actually just check if the claims are matching the data given. Right. And I think this helps us as authors and writers, because sometimes a lot of minor things uh, may muddle up the situation and uh, we may actually get some commentary of the reviewers, which may not be that helpful. But uh, this kind of a review is really helpful. Uh, the third, this point about novelty is very important. And what I mean by this novice objectivity is simply that uh, the system, if it's working right, will push people to 
because uh, we have to have the burden of high objectivity on ourselves, it would probably push people to try to be more objective if it's working right. And when you're pushed to be more objective, you're actually pushed to go out of your expertise and be a novice in a new field. This actually helps to develop science because we start joining all those disciplines together and the research takes place at the boundaries where we all know is where the, you know, the real, uh, where the play is. So uh, that's how it can help. And that, I think that's a very important point. Uh, even if conclusions can be evolved, then we actually are going into better, newer areas and a diverse approach and topic. If you are clear about what is lawful, then I think you're free to do everything else. So we don't, uh, we don't so much depend on heuristics like the length of your title or all other things, which though they are important, as long as you're not caught, uh, infracting on something which is more important. Uh, so that's what I think are going to be the good implications. And the main point about all this is I think that we don't have to, uh, you know, have publishers or even uh, journals of, uh, you know, focusing too much on demanding novelty because I think it would naturally come when the system is working well. Before I talk about accountability, I'll end with another short story. And this is about the secret life of Dr. R.K. Chandra. Uh, Dr. R.K. Chandra was working uh, in a Memorial University in Canada, Newfoundland. And he was a renowned, uh, of course, of Indian origin. And one day uh, when his uh, nurse, uh, nurse assistant, he was working in the field of baby food formulations. And his nurse assistant was recruiting uh, the people for a study and uh, in a few months she actually stumbled upon the study uh, already published in a journal and uh, she was of course perplexed by this and a few years later she stumbled on the, another study which was the follow-up of the study which couldn't possibly have been done with so many people that were claimed and this went on and on the university could not do uh, did not do anything about it uh, uh, because they, it seems they were afraid to be sued. And uh, uh, to just give you, make a short, a long story short, it ended up with having a fake university, uh, a fake, uh, Dr. Chandra was actually editor of a fake journal in which he published uh, studies which were actually reproducing the other works to give them more strength. And uh, he was, was found to have 120 Swiss bank accounts. And it just goes on and on. And uh, in 2015, uh, the publication, which is a Canadian Bro Broadcasting Corporation, which made this expose, uh, he actually served up notice to them and took them to court. And they, uh, the court actually found that everything that they had uh, researched was true about him. And uh, so that was the last uh, I've heard of him. And that's why I'm talking about this case, because the court has actually ruled in favor of CBC. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, though this may sound like a really crazy uh, outlier, I think we, we have an alert here because I really don't find the huge accountability in our system. It's more like a court of public opinion and it's more like, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, some kind of promotions and so on. But we need to realize that a court of public opinion can is not very far from become, becoming more of a mob kind of a rule. And we do have to understand that why we prize our court system in India and in every democracy is mainly because everyone, uh, the smallest voice can be heard in some kind of a system. So I'm not exactly talking about having a court system for our um, for research papers, but a place of appeal and uh, some more accountability injected into the system. So with that, I think that uh, in the triangle, the weakest point is the accountability right now. And I'd just like to sound off the alarm on that. And with that, I have completed uh, this presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Priya. Uh, we truly appreciate it. It was very interesting and your stories were very uh, appropriate and very, um, uh, what do you say, very context, uh, fulfilling to the context. Uh, um, uh, before we uh, really like, you know, I come to the vote of thanks uh, for uh, our librarian, sir, Giridhar, sir. Uh, I just have a quick question for Simon that is in the chat box. Uh, if, uh, Simon, you're there? Yes, I'm here, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, for everybody else, uh, there will be a poll for you guys to take. Uh, please, please attempt to that poll. So, Simon, there is a question. If DOAJ is a credible alternative to Scopus or WOS, I don't know what WOS is, because uh, 
I have heard that even Scopus has predatory journals indexed with them. I mean, I, I think the part of it you have already specified that Scopus might have predatory journals. So that's not a black and white thing. But is uh, the main question here uh, for uh, by Vinayak uh, Shankar is uh, if DOAJ a credible alternative to Scopus? Yeah. So just to explain the term, so DOAJ is the Directory of Open Access Journals. Um, mm -hmm. So that is a directory of um uh a lot <laughs> i think it's about fifteen thousand at the moment um open access journals um so it's a directory um so really it's a list of journals now doaj a few years ago it had a problem it had a large number of open access journals in it but mm -hmm. it uh, it kind of did a, a review and it removed um a, a huge number of predatory journals and it also significantly improved the um, um, the submission procedure. So if you are a publisher of an open access journal, there are many things that you have to do to prove that your journal is legitimate. So um, there may well be, a, as with Scopus, it's not quite black and white. Um, there are, um, it, there may well be a very small number of open of predatory journals in the DOAJ currently. Uh, but the vast majority of them have, have been removed. So it's, like I said, with Scopus, it's not quite correct. Um, but it, in terms of, so that's one question. It, DOAJ isn't really an alternative to Scopus or, or Web of Science, which is what WOS means. Um, it doesn't really do the same thing. Uh, I guess the difference is that DOAJ, um, like predatory reports, it's a list, okay? So there, there isn't really a representation of uh, multiple data points uh, that um, constitutes what an index means. So an index really is something that's been curated and collected. Um, so there's a kind of a proactive element on behalf of the indexer to collect information to include in the index. With DOAJ, it's simply a list of legitimate open access journals. And that's it. Um, I see. So in terms of so you can you should be able to trust doaj you know like i said 99.9 .9 percent of the time in terms of it presenting a list of open access journals but that isn't really an alternative to scopus or web of science scopus is an index so that gives you um, um quite uh, rich information about um about citations etc web of science is kind of is an index but also a kind of elite and it's designed to be the the kind of creme de la creme the kind of upper echelons of journals across all disciplines with um, rich citation data. So Scopus and Web of Science are both indexes. DOAJ is a list, but you can use them all as part of your kind of publishing strategy to identify whether a journal is trustworthy or not. OK, cool. Thank you. Uh, Vinay, uh, we believe it answered your question. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I now uh, request uh, a librarian, sir, uh, Mr. Gildar Kungur, uh, to give a vote of thanks, please. Sir, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Meghana. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, during this webinar, we heard from our speakers about predatory publishers who publish counterfeit journals to exploit the open access model in which the author pays. These predatory journals are dishonest and lack transparency. They aim to dupe researchers, especially those inexperienced in scholarly communication. They set up websites that closely resemble those of legitimate online publishers and publish journals of questionable and uh, are of low quality. So I must thank our speakers today for enlightening us uh, about publication ethics and why and how to avoid predatory journals. I must thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Savik Bhattacharya, and our Director, Professor Sudhir Kumar Barai, for their inspiring leadership, constant support, and continuously motivating us to organize such events. I'd like to thank Professor Asish Kumar Das of Department of Biological Sciences for delivering his insightful and uh, inspirational keynote address despite his busy schedule. 
And uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sneha Road from Cabels for coordinating with us and also with uh, the Department of Biological Sciences in organizing this event. I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to our resource person today, Dr. Simon Lineker, Director of International Marketing and Development at uh, Cabels, who made this webinar very, very interesting with his uh, deep, uh, comprehensive and insightful talk. And I'm sure our faculty members and research scholars uh, must have found it very, very useful and benefited. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Priya Sande, Assistant Professor, Department of Chemical Engineering for delivering a very inform informative talk on uh, ethical and critical thinking aspects, uh, which while writing a paper, which are uh, very, very important before submission of such papers to the publishers. And also thanks to her for uh, narrating stories of uh, King Solomon and uh, Dr. R.K. Chandra. My sincere thanks to Dr. Meghna Thare, Assistant uh, Professor, Department of Biological Sciences for not only her welcome address, but uh, also taking a very keen interest in organizing this event in collaboration with Cabels a renowned scholarly analytics company based in Texas, USA. I shall be failing in my duty if I do not thank uh, the library team. Without their support, uh, this webinar would not have been possible. I thank Dr. Isha Pabandi, Mr. Deepak Mehta, and uh, Mr. Krishan Singh Chauhan for their valuable support. Last but uh, not the least, uh, you wonderful audience, uh, I must really thank each one of you for your active participation and uh, making this uh, webinar successful. Thank you all very much. And we now close this webinar. Thank you all.